Well, let me take this time to uh, welcome all of you to our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, I want to um, just let you know how glad I am uh, every uh, Wednesday night when we can all come together. I, um, I want to make this uh, announcement before we begin. I, I have a list of uh, names that I sent this, um, uh, the material for Wednesday night Bible study to uh, uh, via email. And there's one particular email that I'm struggling with. It's uh, uh, mm20 at gmail.com. And I don't know who uh, has that. It's always, it always bounces back to me, mm20 uh, at, uh, at gmail.com. If, if it's your email and it's wrong, please just uh, let me know and uh, send me the, the correct uh, address and I will be glad to uh, forward the, um, the, the material to you. Again, the email that I'm struggling with, the address is mm20 or 22 at gmail.com. Uh, you know, um, Microsoft says it's, uh, it doesn't exist and so it bounces back to me all the time. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for tonight. And we ask for your blessing as we uh, turn to your word. Speak to our hearts, O God, and teach us and uh, help us to take your word and use it in our lives and bless somebody uh, along uh, uh, you know, the way. And uh, we know, Father, as we prepare to come together in person on August the 30th uh, uh, during the outdoor worship, that again, your spirit and your protection and uh, your blessing will be upon all of us. Father, we know that you love us and that you will always uh, do what is right for us. And so be with us tonight, this uh, very hour, as we uh, turn to our, our study. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are going to um, uh, study uh, an encounter between the Israelites and the Philistines uh, in the, uh, the context of... Uh, um, uh, of um, uh, Eli and his sons and uh, what happened when uh, Eli uh, kept a blind eye to all that was going on in the house of the Lord as his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, uh, ministered and dishonored God through their ministry and um, did that which was uh, not right in the sight of the Lord. And so we'll be looking at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4 and uh, we will also uh, look at a few verses from chapter 6. Let me uh, begin our study by, uh, again, situating our, our study in its context by looking at the introduction which you have on the handout or the material which I sent to you. Tonight's study reveals how the prophesied punishment on Eli's family became a reality. Because of the uh, sin of Eli's sons, the Israelites fought it in their battle with their enemies, the Philistines. In an effort to turn the battle into their favor, the Israelites looked to the symbol of God's presence, the ark. But they did not look to the God behind the symbol. I think that is very instructive. And so Israel just thought that because they had the Ark of the Covenant with them, which of course uh, always went you know, before them, they thought that uh, they would um, you know, win all their battles. What they forgot was that it was uh, a symbolic representation of God's presence. And so rather than actually uh, uh, looking at the uh, actual presence of God by honoring and uh, respecting God himself, they put their, you know, hope and faith in a symbol, which is what we, all, we often do. And so I hope that tonight we can glean some very vital lessons, very uh, uh, important life lessons uh, uh, with, with respect to how we treat God's name and God's you know, presence and how we put obstacles or gods or things between us and God rather than actually uh, looking and worshiping the one and only true God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Israel looked to the symbol of God's presence, which was the Ark of the Covenant, uh, rather than looking at the God who is behind that symbol, that representation. Now, this led to a crushing defeat and the departure of God's glory from among his people. 
when God brought his glory back home by uh, retrieving the ark, uh, the people responded with joy and worship. But again, they forgot God's holiness and they suffered the consequences of that neglect. The people of Israel mistook the symbol of God's presence with his actual presence. Now, years later, God gave his people something greater than a symbol of his presence when, of course, he gave us his only son, Jesus Christ, which is God in the flesh who came to unite us with God himself. Uh, we have read this before, but uh, when we go to uh, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. In the Gospel of John, the uh, fourth Gospel, uh, when we go to uh, the very first chapter of, uh, of John, John chapter 1, and uh, let me read a few verses. You have that in your notes. Uh, John chapter 1, I read from verse 1 to verse 5, and then uh, from verse 9 to verse 14. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's jump to uh, verse 9 of John chapter 1. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. God became flesh in Jesus Christ, and he dwelt with us. And so God's actual presence was made real, was made manifest in none other than God himself in Jesus Christ. And so tonight, we're going to look at how Israel committed that grievous sin of looking at the symbol of the Ark of the Covenant rather than looking at the actual presence of God, respecting and revere, you know, revering the uh, uh, holy presence of God, and that became uh, an issue or a problem for the people of, of Israel. And so I'm going to read from 1 Samuel chapter 4, and I'll read from verse 1 to verse 11. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew near in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, 
were there with the ark of the covenant of God. As soon as the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout, so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid. For they said, A God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines. Let you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated. And Israel fled, every man to his home. And there was a very great slaughter, for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. If you recall last week, we talked about the call of Samuel. How Hannah, who was barren, uh, you know, gave uh, birth to Samuel after Hannah had uh, um, prayed fervently you know, to the Lord, wept, went to the, um, uh, the, the sanctuary, the place of worship at Shiloh uh, from Ramah where they lived. And uh, of course, Eli even mistook Hannah's uh, um, you know, prayer and weeping uh, to be that Hannah was probably intoxicated or had uh, drunk wine. And we all uh, heard the story, we read it, that Hannah said to Eli, your maid servant is not drunk. But this, you know, uh, was the reason why she was actually weeping and praying, to, you know, to the Lord. And of course, God did hear uh, Hannah's prayer, and Samuel was born. And we know uh, that when Samuel was born, Eli, the priest at Shiloh, had two, you know, two sons who were also priests. But these two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were dishonoring God and abusing their priestly privileges. In ministering to the you know, people of shadow, they abused you know, their office. And God was not pleased with them. And God gave a prophecy through Samuel of, of what would happen to the two sons of Eli. And so here is the prophecy of Samuel coming true when in the, in the heat of the battle, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were killed. But that's not where... I want to, uh, you know, put the emphasis in this study. I want you to know that the uh, nation of Philistine was a thorn in the flesh of the Israelites. In fact, uh, we've seen in the story of Samson how the Philistines fought Israel and how God, you know, brought about Samson. And of course, Samson messed up badly. And you will hear more about uh, Samson uh, in a sermon on the 23rd uh, of this month. And of course, how uh, Samson, um, you know, through disobedience and pride, uh, allowed the uh, Philistines to actually uh, disrupt the plan of God. But you notice that uh, Samson made a bad choice and he got himself into trouble. He uh, obviously um, uh, somehow uh, broke the Nazirite vow, which, you know, God had placed on him from his mother's womb. And uh, his eyes were gouged out when finally he gave the secret of his strength to Delilah. And, uh, Sa you know, um, Samson's hair was shaped and the Philistines were able to capture them. But we notice the end of the story. As his hair grew back, you know, he was able to uh, destroy the, you know, Philistines. In fact, the Philistines, uh, a five-seated league, you know, had become this kind of a major enemy of the Israelites from Samson the time of Samuel, the time of Saul, the time of King David. And uh, we will hear more about this as we continue our study in the coming weeks. And so according to uh, what we just read in 1 Samuel chapter 4, the Israelites went out to do battle with the Philistines or against the Philistines. But the first day of the fighting didn't go well at all. 
and there was panic in the camp of the Israelites. The Israelites lost the battle and they lost the battle to the Philistines for one main reason, sin. The sin of Hophni and Phinehas who dishonored God and took advantage of their priestly uh, you know, positions uh, or privileges. Uh, and of course, Eli, their father, the, the, the main or the high priest, allowed the, uh, their sin to go unchecked. And uh, we read about that in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12 to verse 34. And so the elders in the camp mistakenly believed that the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant itself, the symbol of God's presence, would turn the battle in their favor. Another gross mistake. You see, rather than the elders coming together and praying to God, seeking God's face, they put their faith in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a visual representation of God. The Ark of the Covenant was a visual representation of God. Here's the situation. When God took the people of Israel, God taught them. He began to instruct them, to teach them God's ways. It would have been too much for God to just appear to them uh, physically. And so God made them to uh, have this visual representation of God himself through the construction of the Ark of the Covenant. We also know that the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, which was also constructed in the wilderness, also symbolized God's presence with his people. Now, all these representations were pointing forward to that ultimate realization of God himself in the person of Jesus Christ, his son. And so that's why we read from Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, a virgin shall give you know, birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And of course, in John's Gospel, John chapter 1, we also read about you know, how Jesus, in the beginning, was God and how he created, and how he came and was born, God himself, being born in the flesh through Jesus Christ and living with us. Again, so that we may see and experience the actual presence of God. So Israel made a grievous mistake. They put their trust in that symbol of the ark rather than in the actual presence of uh, God. And of course, the battle didn't go well at all. And so they lost the battle. And uh, God was using this as an object lesson to teach the people they lost the battle because they looked to a symbol of God's presence rather than to God himself who expected holiness from and among his people. Sin destroys. Sin becomes a hindrance. It stands between us and God. And Israel saw the grave consequences of allowing sin to stand between uh, her and uh, her God. And so we're going to see how uh, God himself, through his own power, was able to retrieve the Ark of the Covenant and use that as a huge, as a big object lesson for the children of Israel. Let's go now to First Samuel chapter 6 and uh, let me uh, read from verse 13 to verse 16 and then we will come back to chapter 5 and and uh, just try and put the story in its context to help us understand chapter 6. So first Samuel chapter 6 beginning at verse 13. This is the word of the Lord. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley and when they they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark they rejoiced to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stopped there. A great stone was there and they split up the wood of the cart and offered the cows a burnt offering to the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the box that was beside it, in which were the golden figures 
and set them upon the great stone and the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices on that day to the Lord. And when the five lords of the Philistines saw it, they returned that day to Akron. And so this is the story. Let me give you the background to what is taking place here. When you go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5, you will notice that the people of Israel continue to do battle with the Philistines. And we just read in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4 uh, that um, when the, um, uh, the Israelites engaged in battle with the Philistines, they were defeated. We are told here they were soundly and, uh, um, you know, roundly defeated. And in fact, what happened was that they killed over 30,000 foot soldiers of the Israelites and the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was captured and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas died. And so there was a problem. There was sin in the camp. In the first place, the prophecy of God through Samuel had come to pass, to be fulfilled in the death of Hophni and Phinehas, the uh, sons of Eli. Later on, Eli himself, uh, you know, would die. But there was a problem here. God's visual representation of his presence among his people was gone through the Ark of the Covenant. And this was a huge problem. The good part of the story is that God used the capturing of the ark to show, to demonstrate to both Israel and the Philistines that God fights his own battles. God doesn't need you and me, anybody to do his, his battles for him. God fights God's own battles for God's own glory. You see, God has given us the privilege of being co liberous with him. It is an extension of God's love and grace to us so that we can be co liberous with God in this sacred task of making disciples for the kingdom of God. And so, God doesn't need you and me, God doesn't need anybody to do God's battles for him. And this was the lesson that God was going to teach both Israel and the enemies of Israel, the Philistines. And so when we go to 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 19 to 22, just look at what is going on here. 1 Samuel chapter 4, 19 to 22. Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant, about to give birth. And when she heard of the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of, of her death, the woman attending her said, Do not be afraid, for you have born a son. But she did not answer or pay attention. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory of God has departed from Israel, because the ark of the covenant has been captured, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of the Lord has been captured. And so one of the, um, um, you know, the um, daughters-in-laws of Eli gave birth and named the child Ichabod, which means the glory of God has departed. She says through her spirit that something terrible has happened. And she says that there was sin in the camp of Israel. And so, while the Israelites believed the glory of God was lost, the Lord defended his own glory. And he did something among the enemies of the Israelites, that is the Philistines. First, the Philistines of Ashdod and Gath and Ekron were all afflicted with tumors and the fear of death when the ark came to their cities. And so when the, the Philistines defeated the Israelites and they took the ark of the covenant and they sent it to these you know, cities that I've just mentioned, the cities of the Philistines, Ash, um, 
Ashdod and Gath and Ekron, God afflicted the inhabitants of these cities with the you know tumors. Number two, after seven months of turmoil, the Philistines decided to return the ark back to the Israelites. And you know what they did? They carved some guilt offering of gold objects symbolizing their affliction to appease the god of the israelites you know because they had their own gods the chief god you know that we, we called dagon you know they thought that they could uh, somehow mimic the god of israel uh you know by the way they you know uh, uh treated their gods and so they made some kind of uh, um gold objects to symbolize all the different things that had been uh, um, uh, brought upon them, the afflictions that they had to endure. And so the ark was put on a cart. So this is what the Philistines in these cities of Ashdod and Gath and Ekron, this is what they did. They put the ark on a cart to be drawn by two cows that had just given birth to some little calves. And this is what they, you know, they did. They said to themselves, if the cows went over their calves with the cart in which the Ark of the Covenant was resting, then they would you know, feel or maybe think that, uh, well, nothing but just sheer coincidence that all these afflictions are coming upon us. But if the two cows had it straight to Israel, not deviating to anywhere uh, as they just went straight on the road and they went all the way to Israel, you know, uh, to uh, Beth Shemesh, then they will know that indeed the afflictions had come from God. So let me read from um, 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verses 1 to 12. And you can get the story there uh, beautifully. First Samuel 6, 1 to 12. The Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of the Lord, was in the country of the Philistines seven months. So the Ark was there for seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, What shall we do with the Ark of the Lord? Tell us, with what shall we send it to its place? They said, that is the diviners and the priests of the, uh, of the Philistines. This was their response. Look at verse 3 of chapter 6. They said, if you send away the ark of the, of the God of the Israelites, do not send it empty, but by all means return him a guilt offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand does not turn away from you. And they said, what is the guilt offering that we shall return to him? They answered, five golden tumors, five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For the same plague was on all of you and on your lords. So you must make images of your tumors and images of your mice that ravaged the land and give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps... He will lighten his hand from off you and your gods and your land. Why should you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts after he had dealt severely with them? Did they not send the people away and they departed? Now then, take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows on which there has never come a yoke and yoke the cows to the cart. But take their calves away from them and take the ark of the Lord and place it in the cart and put it in a box at its side, the figures of gold which you are returning to him as a guilt offering. Then set it off and let it go its way. And watch, if it goes up on the way to its own land to Beth Shemesh, then it is he who has done this great harm. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by coincidence. And so, to put it in very simple language, what the Philistines did was that they prepared a cart 
and this card was to be drawn by two horses that had just given birth that had never had any yoke around them and the philistines prepared some gifts guilt offerings and they put them alongside the ark and they made this proclamation that if the two cows went straight not deviating from you know the uh, the road to Beth Shemesh a city not you know in the land of Israel then they knew that God had afflicted them but if that didn't happen then maybe that was you know no coincidence now it is interesting what actually occurred because we notice that the two cows as we just read went straight to Beth Shemesh now the the, the name Beth Shemesh actually was a town that was home to the priest of Israel, the Aaronic, the Levites. That was one of the you know, cities that God had given to them. And so it was a city set aside for the livelihood of the priest, the Levites, and of course, all those who came uh, after the, you know, you know, those priests. And you can read about it in your notes. How fitting that the ark of the Lord should return to this city of Beth Shemesh with those who were very responsible for its care, i.e. the priest. And so, these Philistines knew that God was the one who had afflicted them. Now, you notice something very important in this story. God fought his own battle. The battle was God's own. He didn't need the Israelites nor the Philistines. To do anything for him in fact god didn't need the israelites god was teaching them that the ark was a visual representation on its own there was nothing special about the ark it was a way of teaching the israelites that god is with them god is with them just as the tabernacle was constructed in the land of israel and so tonight i want all of us to understand that visual representations that we make of God, all the relics that we have in our, uh, our, our, you know, sanctuaries in our churches, they avail nothing. You and I don't need any visual representation of God. It is just a reminder to us. But we should focus on the one that is visually represented in all the artifacts, the cross, the crown, um, Mary, the Virgin, you know, you name it. Rather than putting our faith in those visual representations that we see, we should put our faith in the God who called us, in the God who made us. And so tonight, I want us to you know, think carefully about how we honor God, about the things that we do to uh, bring reverence and respect to God. Let's go to uh, you know, 1 Samuel chapter 6. Reading from verse 19 to verse 21. And he struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh, because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck 70 men of them, and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. Then the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord this holy God? And to whom shall he go up away from us. So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kiriath Jerem, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to you. Now this part of the story is very instructive. Israel, over and over and over again, has sinned and continues to sin against God. We have seen how the two sons of Eli sinned and abused their office. And how Eli, the chief priest at Shadow, just kept a blind eye to the sins and to the abuses of his children. We have seen how God, through Samuel, made a prophecy that the two sons of Eli will be punished. And we saw that in the battle against the Philistines, in which the Philistines actually uh, routed or defeated the Israelites, and of course the two sons of Eli were killed. 
We have also seen how the ark of the Lord was captured. The visual representation of God that was with the people that went with Israel as they made their way to the promised land. How that also, you know, was actually captured. And something miraculous took place. God's presence was to be with his people. God's presence is with us as long as we revere, as long as we respect, as long as we pay heed to what God uh, is doing in our lives and what God is doing to glorify himself. Now, because God is a holy God, God could not coexist with sin and with any other God. And so the gods of the Philistines, the chief god Dagon, God wanted to show that Dagon was no god at all. And so God himself did his own battle. And so the Philistines got into trouble. And the trouble was that because the very presence of God in the ark was with them, because they had captured it, God brought tumors. God afflicted the Philistines. And the Philistines, you know, decided to return the ark of the Lord to Israel. And we've seen the dramatic way in which they did it. And of course, the two cows went straight to Beth Shemesh, uh, to that city, uh, which was actually a place for the Levites. And we've seen what an appropriate and, fit and fitting thing to do uh, to take the ark to where it will be cared for by those who were specially prepared to care for the ark. That is the, you know, the priest and, and the Levites. But then something happened. Some of the people in Beth Shemesh who knew that you couldn't touch the ark, who knew that you couldn't look in the ark, when the ark was returned, remember the Philistines had put it in a box and uh, kind of sealed it. And so when the ark was brought to Beth Shemesh, the Levites took it and they opened it up and they were going to put it in, in the place where it should be. And some of the inhabitants, about 70 of them in that city, looked at the ark and looked in the ark. Again, hear me out. They looked at the ark and they looked in. Remember, in the ark, there were some very important artifacts which God had used to show his very presence and his power. You know, the, um, uh, the staff of, uh, of Aaron that battered Moses, uh, the showbread, and some very important artifacts. All of that designed to show how holy, how sacred God is and everything that God, uh, you know, uh, has. Uh, and so when these inhabitants did that, it was an affront against the holiness of God. It is not just looking at the ark or looking inside the ark that was the problem the problem was sin remember it was sin that got Hophni and Phinehas into trouble and of course their father Eli it was sin that made the Israelites lose to the Philistines it was sin that brought about the capture of the ark of the covenant and now Israel had not learned its lesson it is again sin that was going to bring about destruction as the people looked into the ark and they also uh, did not revere the ark of the Lord. You see, God had given strict instructions to Aaron and his descendants regarding the ark of the covenant. And uh, if we go to Numbers chapter 15, just let me read a few instructions. I want to make a point here which I will really want you to, uh, you know, follow because it's important. God is very particular. Whatever God says, God means it. Sometimes we think we serve a God of love and therefore we can do things anyhow. I want us tonight to understand that God is very particular. So let's go to um, Numbers chapter 4 and let's look at verses 15 and then we will jump to verses 17 to 20 relating to the ark of the covenant uh, you know numbers chapter 4 beginning at verse 15 and when aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the finishings of the sanctuary as the camp sets out after the sons of kohath 
shall come to carry these, but they must not touch the holy things, lest they die. They were instructed not to touch the Ark of the Covenant, even those who were bearing the Ark. You see, the Ark was prepared in such a way that they could put some kind of uh, two poles through the um, little um, you know, pockets that they made on the side of the Ark so that nobody could touch the Ark. And then they would carry it on their shoulders. Because the Ark and the things that were in the Ark were all holy sacrosanct objects and god was trying to teach them that you don't come near to god when you are defiled you come to god when you ask god for forgiveness when you repent you see god accepts us anyhow but god was teaching the israelites how holy god is and what it meant to have god as the god of holiness and god was teaching them that they ought to be holy as God himself is holy. Let's go to verses 17 to 20 of Numbers chapter 4. Verse 17. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Let not the tribes of the clans of the Kohathites be destroyed from among the Levites, but deal thus with them, that they may live and not die when they come near to the most holy things. Aaron and his sons shall go in and appoint them each to his task and to his burden, but they shall not go in to look on the holy things even for a moment, lest they die. Again, don't think of God as a very hard task master, a strict disciplinarian. No. But remember, this was the beginning of Israel as a nation, ancient Israel, as God's chosen people. God was trying to teach them the difference between that which is holy and that which is defiled. Remember when we go to Leviticus. Let me read from Leviticus. Let's go to the book of Leviticus, the third book of Moses. And let's read from chapter 19 and see what God says about holy things and about the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, let's read from verse 1 to verse 2. Leviticus chapter 19. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, I am holy. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, I am holy. And so God expects us, his people, to be holy. You know, holiness is not something that we have. Holiness is an attribute of God. Only God is holy. And God takes us and he, he washes us. He purifies us and he clothes us with his rope of holiness, with his rope of righteousness. You see, God expects his people to follow his pattern of holiness in both the separation from sin and devotion to his glory. We are to eschew sin. We are to avoid sin. Yes, we live in a world of sin. And yet, when we become people of God, God, through Jesus Christ, you know, robes us, puts on us his own garment of holiness and righteousness. And God wants us to live lives that are pleasing to him. Hophni and Phinehas, who were priests of God at Shiloh, did not revere, did not respect God. And we saw the end uh, of their lives. God is teaching us through this lesson tonight that God wants us to follow his pattern of holiness. The Ark of the Covenant was to symbolize God's holiness. The Ark of the Covenant was to show the power of God. But we need to come to God himself. As the people of Israel did that mistake of just focusing on that symbol rather than going to God, God wants us to come to him and God wants us to allow him to wash us, to clothe us, and to give us his holiness. You see, 
God has made us holy and he wants us to be holy. Our sins separate us from the holy God as it happened to us through our first parents, Adam and Eve. But thanks be to God. Because we serve a God who is gracious. Because we serve a God who is merciful. Because we serve a God who is so loving and so compassionate. God came down in his son Jesus Christ. God has washed away our sin. God died for our sin through Jesus Christ. And God has put on us his garment, his robe of holiness and his righteousness. Tonight, I want to encourage you that we don't need to live in our sin. We don't need to continue to just wallow in those sinful habits because we serve a God who is more than capable, more than able to help us overcome those sinful habits. In the book of Romans, as we come to the end of our study tonight, let's go to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, which we all know very well, but I want to read it to your hearing. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for our sins. Praise God for Jesus Christ that while we were still in our sin, God the merciful, God the gracious one came down in Jesus and he died to save us. In 1 John chapter 2, let me go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 to 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. Praise God for Jesus Christ, my Christian friend, my Christian brother, my Christian sister. J Jesus Christ, God himself, has come down and has washed us from the sins that continue to separate us from, uh, no, from him. All those weights that weigh us down, God through Christ has taken them away. And God, in his compassion, in his grace, has put on us his robe of holiness and his robe of righteousness. Tonight, it is my prayer that we will continue to accept the holiness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that we will go to him and allow him to wash us from the sins that continue to separate us from the God who loves us so much. May God bless you. May God be with you and may God continue to purify and sanctify and make you holy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, thank you so much for tonight's lesson. Thank you for the uh, lesson that you do not coexist with sin. You are a holy God. And that through the visual representation of the Ark of the Covenant, you were teaching the ancient people of Israel how holy you, God, are. And you are teaching us through Jesus Christ that you are the God of holiness, the God of compassion, the God of grace. And that when we have sinned, we can come to you because you will wash us and you will make us pure. And so, Lord, I pray for each person tonight I pray that we all, Lord, will come to you in our sinful human state and that we will allow you to wash us and make us pure again. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for all that you're doing. We pray for this great country in which we live. We pray for your people and we pray especially for those who are hurting because they've loved or lost their loved ones through COVID-19. And Lord, as we prepare to come together in person, we also want to pray that you will keep us safe and you, you will keep us well. That nothing will come to destroy this kind of relationship that we have with you. That you will keep us safe in your arms of love. 
and that we will be able to worship you and praise you for who you are. Give us all a good night rest tonight and give us all a good evening. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for staying with us tonight. And I look forward to seeing you uh, next uh, uh, Wednesday. And of course, tune in uh, you know, virtually for our service as uh, we've been doing uh, for some great messages. And of course, to be uplifted, to be encouraged, and to receive God's blessing. May God bless you and may God be with you. <laughs>